Ken rocks an arm injury, times two. How he got injured, what injuries he suffered, why he almost considered an amputation, and how he got back to his winning ways in 2020. Stay tuned to find out. Hey everybody, Dr. Chris, orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician. Welcome to my channel, your number one source for information on orthopedics and sports medicine that's easy to understand for everyone. Okay. If you're new to the channel and you want to know more about my life as an orthopedic surgeon, be sure to follow me on Instagram or Twitter at Stable Knees. I'm also on TikTok at Dr. Chris Rayner. And did I mention, I'm on a mission to teach everybody about orthopedics and sports medicine. So help me do that by sharing this video with anyone you know that might be interested in this topic. Okay, yeah. If you're looking for information on workouts or exercises, or you want more information on injury prevention, don't forget to check us out on our sister channel on YouTube, Human 2.0. For a while now, many of you have been asking me to do a video on motocross or supercross injuries. And I have been promising to do that for a long time, so I figured that I would finally get around to it. Previously in the comments section, many of you have mentioned Ken Roxon as a potential athlete to cover when discussing motocross injuries. I decided to include Ken in a list of potential athletes that I might cover in a motocross video. After starting to research this athlete, I realized that I couldn't just lump him in with other athletes and that I would need to have a video just to himself to cover the injuries that he has experienced and his road to recovery. While doing my research, I was amazed to discover what this young man has gone through and I was even more amazed to see how he has worked to get himself back onto the podium and moreover, even that it was possible at all. With that being said, let's get to discussing Ken Roxon. Ken Roxon is a German professional motocross and supercross racer. He has competed in the World Motocross Championship between 2009 and 2011, and subsequently competed in the AMA Motocross Championship from 2012 to 2020. On his journey to the present day, he has accumulated a number of titles that include the MX2 Class Motocross World Champion title, the Motocross de Nation winner title, the 250cc Class West Coast Supercross title, the 450cc Class Monster Energy Cup winner title, and the two-time 450cc Class US Motocross Championship title. That's a lot of titles. Most recently, Ken has won the 2020 Atlanta Supercross 450 main event and the Glendale, California Supercross 450 main event. He has been riding a motorcycle since the age of three and has been competing successfully for almost as long. However, the fact that he can even ride a motorcycle, much less compete at the highest level, is a minor miracle. In fact, to be honest, it's two minor miracles. Let me explain. In 2016, Ken was the runner-up in the AMA Supercross Championship point standings with five wins. He went on to win the AMA Motocross title for the second time that same year with 20, you heard me correctly, 20 wins. In 2017, Roxon joined the Honda Factory Racing HRC team. He was favored to win the AMA Supercross Championship after finishing second in 2016. Ken won the first two races of the 2017 season. Then on January 21st of 2017, he was racing in Anaheim in the third round of the Supercross series. The track in Anaheim was soft and rutted as a result of rain the previous day. The track overall was not in great shape at the time of the race. On the ninth lap of the main event while running in third, Roxon took a well-worn line into the takeoff of a triple jump. Unfortunately, his bike bottomed out, causing his rear suspension to rebound, bouncing Ken from the seat as the bike launched whoosh, into the air. Roxon was airborne for approximately two seconds. This was immediately prior to him landing on the ground, arms first, with his body outstretched behind him. Roxon landed nearly 30 feet from the point of takeoff, with the full weight of his body landing onto his outstretched left arm in what is known as a foosh fall on outstretched hand mechanism. He was in obvious distress while he was on the ground 
and he was unable to remount his motorcycle to continue racing. He received immediate medical attention while on the racing surface, and he had his left arm splinted before he left the track. He was taken from the track by the medical team to receive more definitive medical care elsewhere. Unfortunately, Roxon suffered a compound or an open fracture of his left forearm after landing face first on the track surface. Roxon was rushed to the nearby UC Irvine Medical Center, where his arm was assessed by the trauma surgeons. His radius and ulna were not only broken, but they were protruding through the skin. In addition, both his wrist and his elbow were dislocated. After the initial assessment and radiographic imaging, a closed reduction was performed to provisionally or temporarily reduce Roxon's wrist, elbow, and forearm fractures. This was done in preparation for the irrigation and debris mont and definitive fixation of his injuries. He was also treated with tetanus toxoid and intravenous antibiotics, given that this was an open fracture dislocation. These injuries are complicated by the fact that they have an increased risk of infection of the wound and the fracture fragments. Ken's forearm was splinted while the surgeons planned on how next to proceed. However, additional imaging scans revealed that the damage was more severe than had originally been assessed. And so, after some deliberation, Roxon, his girlfriend, and his agent chartered a private jet to fly him to Orange County in Vail, Colorado to see Dr. Randy Viola, who is a hand, wrist, elbow, and orthopedic trauma specialist at the Stedman Clinic. Roxon arrived at the clinic the following morning. However, in the interim, while traveling, Roxon had developed compartment syndrome in his left forearm. Compartment syndrome is a condition where bleeding and swelling within a particular muscular compartment are severe enough to raise the pressure in that compartment to a value that is higher than the pressure of the blood that is perfusing that compartment. That basically means that the compartment is so tight that blood can't get in. Not only can blood not get into the compartment, but also blood cannot get out of the compartment as well. This pressure is high enough to cause damage to both the muscle and the nerve tissue within the compartment as well. If not treated quickly and the pressure not released within a period of six hours, then both the muscle and the nerve tissue can die. If there is substantial loss of muscle tissue due to tissue necrosis or death, this condition may lead to an amputation of the involved extremity. Dr. Viola immediately took Roxon to the operating room for decompressive fasciotomies. Now this is just a procedure that is performed to release the pressure within the compartments where compartment syndrome is suspected or has been confirmed by examination. And during this procedure, the fascial tissue or the envelope around the muscular compartment is open to relieve the pressure within that compartment. The compartment is left open until the pressure has decreased enough to allow its closure. Usually, this can occur after a few days. However, sometimes this may take several weeks if the swelling is particularly bad. After fasciotomies were performed, Roxon's forearm tissues were allowed to swell unrestricted, thereby decreasing the pressures within the compartment allowing them to be perfused by oxygenated blood once again. Over the next two weeks, Roxon returned to the operating room on several occasions. Each time he underwent an irrigation and a debris mop. And this is just a procedure where we vigorously wash both the wound and the contaminated bone fragments in order to remove any dirt or contaminants from the operative field. In other words, this is a procedure used to clean out the wound and the bones that were involved in the fracture or injury. In Roxon's case, the bones that were involved in the fracture had been grossly, and I mean severely contaminated when he fell onto the track. The exposed bone had dug into the dirt and subsequently had been severely contaminated. Several washout procedures were required in order to adequately remove all of the dirt and contamination and to minimize the chance of bacterial infection. An external fixator was also applied during this time to provide some stability to the fracture fragments before definitive fixation or permanent fixation was applied. 
And an external fixator is basically a mechanical frame that is attached to the body on the outside to provide some stability when plates and screws cannot be applied on the inside of the body. After some time, once the area of injury in the forearm appeared to be stably clean, the both bones forearm fracture was fixed with an open reduction and internal fixation using plate and screw fixation. Although Roxon's radial head was also fractured, Dr. Viola did not fix the radial head fracture at this time. After fixation of the forearm fractures, Dr. Viola allowed Roxon to return home to Florida for one week before having him return for fixation of the radial head fracture. And this is not unusual. Sometime in cases of severe trauma where a significant amount of post-operative swelling is anticipated, we will perform procedures in a staged fashion one after the other with enough time in between to allow swelling to settle down. However, in Roxon's case, upon his return to the Stedman Clinic, Dr. Viola discovered that the radial head had necrose, or in other words, fallen apart. As a result, was no longer suitable for fixation. That sucks. This is a particular problem because the radial head is required for stability of the elbow joint and to allow force to be applied normally through the forearm. Since Roxon's head could not be repaired, Dr. Viola would need to implant an artificial metal radial head replacement to restore stability to Roxon's elbow. This option, however, would not have allowed Roxon to continue racing. Traumatic injuries of the hand, wrist, and elbow have ended the careers of other riders before Roxon. To give Roxon every chance of being able to compete again, Dr. Viola instead chose to proceed with a more progressive option. Dr. Viola placed Roxon on the list for a transplant with a fresh allograft radial head. And this is basically a radial head from a recently deceased donor. Dr. Viola used an external fixator and a splint to maintain stability of Roxon's forearm and elbow while he was waiting for a suitably matched radial head transplant. He was allowed to return home again in the interim while awaiting a image matched donor. And this just means that before the transplant procedure, we use a number of imaging modalities to take measurements of the patient's arm, elbow, and forearm so that we can appropriately size a transplanted radial head for selection. And then subsequently, once a radial head becomes available, we'll be able to compare the measurements of the donor radial head against those of the patient's um, own anatomy in order to know whether that radial head is too big, too small, or just right. Roxon returned to Dr. Viola at the Stedman Clinic in April, two months after he had last left the clinic. He returned for surgery number 12. I said 12, as in two after the number 10. 12 surgeries so far. In this surgery, surgery number 13, the donor radial head was transplanted by Dr. Viola. Fortunately for Ken, the donor radial head was a perfect, perfect fit. After transplantation, Roxon returned home. Following the surgery, and after receiving confirmation that the transplant had indeed been successful, Roxon began therapy in earnest. He hired a live-in physical therapist to work with him twice a day during his rehabilitation. Roxon stated that since he was left-handed, and that the injury involved his left arm, he wanted to be able to use his arm normally again. Eventually, as his strength improved, Roxon's spark to return to racing ignited. He set his mind to coming back to, as he said, seek and freaking destroy. Well, he didn't say freaking destroy, I add the freaking, but to seek and destroy. Roxon rehabilitated himself like a fiend over the next six months in order to not only be able to ride a motorcycle again, but furthermore, to be able to ride competitively once again. This, right here, this was the first of Ken's two miracles. That's only the first. Fast forward to the first Supercross race of 2018 in Anaheim. It is early January and Roxon is practicing for the event. On the first practice laps, Roxon appeared stiff, 
and cautious and without any of the style and grace that he had showed only one year prior. He was not yet able to fully straighten his left elbow and he did not yet have a full range of motion in his left wrist. He rode with constant pain. If there was a silver lining, however, it was that the injury had involved his left hand, which only operates the clutch and not the right hand, which operates both the throttle and the front brake. To allow him to better hold onto the bike, Roxon added a thicker and a stickier grip to his left handlebar. And he used the strength of his right arm, chest, and upper back to compensate. Remarkably, Roxon completed the fastest lap in qualifying for this event with a messed up arm. In the main event, Roxon finished fourth. And in the next four races, he continued favorably with three podium finishes. In the Houston race, he even led for half of the race. At this point, it appeared as though Roxon was back to 100% and as though nothing had ever happened. Ken Roxon was back. In week six of 2018, Roxon faced one of his toughest rivals, Cooper Webb in San Diego. The two are known to have off track beef with one another. During the main event, Cooper attempted to block past Ken to overtake him for third position. Falling prey to personal animosity, Roxon saw red and he retaliated to regain position. Unfortunately, the next few seconds are as if out of some sort of tragic comedy. As Roxon attempted to pass back, his back tire spat out of a rut and inadvertently caused him to apply too much throttle, causing him to crash into Webb. Roxon fell backwards toward Webb's motorcycle, which was lying on its side on the ground with the rear tire still spinning. Unbelievably, Roxon's right hand was sucked between the swing arm and the spinning rear tire of Webb's bike and then spit back out. Once again, Roxon's hand, wrist, and forearm have been unimaginably damaged, except that this time, this is his good arm. Roxon returned to the Stedman Clinic for definitive treatment by none other than Dr. Viola. Although the injuries were extensive, they were much more readily addressed than were the injuries for Ken's left arm, believe it or not. This time, Roxon's list of injuries included metacarpal fractures, a carpal metacarpal dislocation, articular injuries of the metacarpals and his right thumb, and a comminuted fracture of one of the carpal bones of the wrist. Yeah, that sounds pretty terrible. In addition, he suffered a neurologic injury to his right thumb. Dr. Viola performed an open reduction and internal fixation of the second metacarpal with a plate and screws. He also performed a CMC fusion or a carpal metacarpal fusion, an articular graft for the metacarpal and a partial carpectomy for the comminuted carpal fracture. And this just means a removal of one of the carpal bones because the fracture was too fragmented in order to allow an adequate repair. Roxon rehabilitated religiously after surgery and only three months after his San Diego crash, he returned to motocross racing. In fact, he raced a full outdoor season following this injury. It was necessary for him to wear wrist braces and for him to tape his wrist and his right thumb to allow this. He raced with significant pain during the entire season, especially in his right thumb. At LaRocco's Leap at Red Bud, the most famous jump on the motocross circuit, there are only two of 90 riders that chose to hit the triple jump full pin rather than to split LaRocco's Leap into two jumps, minimizing risk. The only two riders to do this were Gauthier Paulin of France and of course, Ken Roxon. In the 2019 season, Roxon finished fourth overall. In the 2020 season, Roxon has appeared on the podium in six of the first eight races, including a first place in Glendale 
and a first place in St. Louis in the Supercross series. Once again, it appears as though Ken Roxon is back. This right here was the second of two miracles that Ken Roxon has experienced during his young life. Roxon was once quoted to say, I want to transcend the sport. If you dedicate yourself to something, you can do it. I want to be loved and to go further than anybody ever has. And while Roxon may have something to prove to the motocross world, it seems as though he has already proven that you can do whatever you set your mind to. So today we've been talking about Ken Roxon, his arm injury, and his two, that's right, two minor miracles. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday <laughs> ortho. Just a flesh wound.